Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. Today, I wanted to do something a little fun. I don't know what day you're listening to this on, but when I'm recording this, it's Halloween, and I'm going to go over the myth and the legend, and even the folk tales to some extent, about Halloween and why it exists. And the thing is, I want to say right off the bat that I'm dealing with myth and I'm dealing with legends. You may have heard a different story for all of this, and that's fine. Myths and legends have plenty of different, even contradicting stories at time. So this is just for fun. Take it for what it's worth. So a lot of people treat Halloween as if it was almost a semi-holiday. And to some extent, they're right. It's meant to be the day before a feast day. And November the 1st is supposed to be the feast day of all saints. And that's what Halloween actually means. It's an old term meaning All Hallows Eve, or the evening before the day of All Hallows, that is to say the evening before the day of All Saints, which is a great feast in the church. And the reason why that feast was placed there was because of something from old Irish Celtic myth. And those holidays that were supplanted by All Saints Day were the two holidays of Samhain's Day, which was on October 31st, and Bertin's Day, which is the 1st of November. And to explain the connection between the two, I'll have to go far, far back into Irish history and mythology. Now, there were a number of people that lived in Ireland long before the Celts. The Celts got there the place was certainly already inhabited, and they took over the land from another group of people. These people would be the Tuatha de Dona, or the people of the goddess Dona. And these people were great rulers of Ireland, and they ruled it for quite some time. But before them, there was the Furblog. And the Furblog were Greek, actually. They came from the city of Cadmus, which would be Argos. And they were slaves there. They were called the Men of the Bag. And if you know anything about Argos, it's very hilly, very rocky, and there was very little soil there. So what the men of the bag, the Furblogs, had to do was they were slaves that were sent to other places in Greece that had soil to fill up a bag of soil and have to carry it all the way back to Argos so that they could make fields so that people could plant crops around there. And so they escaped this enslavement and came all the way to Ireland. But their rule of Ireland wasn't very long. They were supplanted by the Tuatha Dé who actually were said to have come to Ireland through the air. But prior to the Furblogs and their control of Ireland, there was yet another race behind them, and that is the race of the Shea. And the Shea are a race that is shrouded in mystery and myth. And they were great users of magic, supposedly. And aside from all of those races in Ireland, there was another race which always tried to put Ireland under its thumb, always tried to put it under tribute and make them pay tribute. And these were the Fomar. And the Fomar were said to live beyond the sea or underneath the sea, so far to the west of Ireland. And they came up from beneath the sea and tried to take over Ireland in so much as they would take spoils from it all the time. And the Fomar never really wanted Ireland for themselves. They just wanted whoever was there to pay tribute to them. And the Fomar were said to be very ugly, misshapen, grotesque people. That is to say, they would have one hand and one foot, or one eye and one ear, or no nose, and things like this. But they are always seen as people. Now, this is very important because a lot of people in their fanciful representation of the Fomar represent them as monsters. But this is not actually how Irish myth works because in Ireland, throughout its history, monsters, you will find very few monsters indeed. And certainly, there was no great account of destroying a monster. The only really big myth around destroying monsters was the battle of the cat heads and the dog heads. And when that battle took place, all of the men who fought against these monsters that had cat heads and dog's heads were ashamed to actually fight these creatures because it was a shame to fight anyone who wasn't a man. Only men 
would give you honor. Only fighting against other men would give you honor as an Irish warrior. Fighting against a monster meant nothing. It was actually a shameful act that you had to actually go out and do this. So the Fomar were men. And even though they're pictured as other things, monstrous, that is to say, non-men in some of these pictures, in the actual mythology, they're always pictured as men, just very ugly, grotesque men. You might say monstrous looking men, but not monsters in the technical term that we use today. Now, of all these races, as you go farther, farther back into Irish history, they become more great and powerful users of magic. Now, even the Celts, who were the last ones to take over Ireland, they had magic users, they had their druids, but the Tuatha Dé Danna were greater magic users than the Celts. The Furblogs, well, they were Greek and they were foreigners. Really, so much they just concentrated on their arms. But the Shea were the greatest magic users of them, of them all. But at the same time, as every succeeding race came in and took over Ireland, it was the strength of their arms. It was the strength of their fighting, which eventually won the day. And when the Shea kept on being displaced and kept on being displaced and kept on being displaced by these new waves of people that would come into Ireland and conquer it, they were driven farther and farther into the hills. And when I say into the hills, I mean that quite literally. Now, I find it quite funny when you watch modern movies and they show these historical settings where you have these giant castles and palaces. There's a new one coming out with Robin Hood. And they show these giant castles. And in the old myth, especially in the older myth, like we have with the Shea and most of Irish mythology, people didn't live in castles. They're called palaces. They're called castles sometimes in the myth. But what they lived in were called rats. And a rath is basically a hollowed out hill. And that's where they would live. So these people would live in hollowed out hills. And sometimes they would actually build a castle-like structure, a wooden structure, and then just heap dirt on top of it instead of actually hollowing out a hill. But it's the same effect. They lived inside the hills. And I suppose you could think of it as if they lived in hobbit-like holes. I wouldn't say they'd be as comfortable as a hobbit hole, but this is the kind of places where they would live. And the farther back you go in history, the more and more these people actually lived in raths and hollowed out hills. And this happened right up until, at the very least, I would say the 1200s. There are accounts of this happening in Ireland, in England, in Scotland. Um, even the story of Robin Hood has characters that are trolls. They're actually just dwarves. They live out in the forest, in the hills. They, they live under the ground or in a hill. So the farther you go back in history, this is what they lived in. They lived in hills. They lived in raths. And when these Shea were driven into the hills, they were quite literally driven into the forest and lived under the ground, in hills. And when the Shea were driven into these places, they disappeared. But the people who took over from the Shea, they saw their disappearance as part of their magic. That is to say that they would hide from the normal people in the forest, in the hills, and they would use their magic to disguise everything in order to make sure that they were not discovered, in order to make sure that they were not driven further and further away. And this could have been quite simply their very good use of camouflage, but it was always seen as part of their magic. To an extent that there were tales of the fact that the Shea actually lived in houses of glass, great towers of glass that they could look out of, but no one could see into. And this is where they lived in some myths, but mostly it would be under the hills. Now, this connects to another part of Celtic mythology, which is very deep and very mysterious as well. It is the idea of other worlds. And in Celtic mythology, there were other worlds everywhere. And what separated this world from the other worlds was very thin, as thin as fabric, light, light fabric. And you could get to an other world through many, many different ways. 
and there are tales about people simply crossing bridges into an other world, going under the water to get to an other world, going into a cave, going through a door, going into a hill where the Shea would live, going down a well, or going into some place which contained water, like down a stream. And even to some extent, the idea of bards, where they have an impact in the kind of games that we play today, where you can be a bard. A bard could open a portal to another world through his song, and so could a druid. And these gateways between the two worlds existed almost everywhere and could be opened very easily, but for the most of the time they were shut. And these other worlds, it was not simply one other world. There were other worlds all over the place, and many different ones. And some of them were heavens, and some of them were hells. And there are ones where you could go to the undying lands, where this description was that no man grew old, there was no strife, there was no fighting, and from the heavens it did not rain water, but it rained beer. But at the same time, there were some lands that would be hells, and these portals to these other worlds could be pierced through different kinds of means, but usually they were shut. However, there was one night of the year in which all of these portals to these other worlds would be opened, and that would be Sawain's Day, which is October 31st. And all of the inhabitants of these other worlds could come through to our world through these portals that would be opened on October 31st, on Sawayan's Day. And it became part of folk history that the Shea, who were the ones who lived underneath the hills, would have a great procession that would come out of the hills from these other worlds where they lived and fled to on Sawayan's Day, on that night of Sawayan's Day. And they would come out and have a great train that would proceed through the forest through uninhabited places on that night. And the thing is that the idea of the Shea eventually developed into what we would think of as fairies and leprechauns. So the ideas of leprechauns and of fairies both come from the idea of the Shea, going into their hills, going into their other worlds, using their magic to stay there, and only coming out in trains, big trains of them coming out once a year. However, they could come out through the portals, just like people could go in through the portals every once in a while. And these are where we get the ideas of fairies from, from the Shea. And in Irish folklore, moving on from myth and legend to folklore, in Irish folklore, the fairies were nasty, nasty people. That is to say, they guarded their secrecy so much that they would be very cruel in making sure that no one discovered them. And this would go back to the Shea, wanting to be left alone in their hills. And the one tale that springs to mind about these people, about these fairies and how nasty they were, was a tale about a woman who was having trouble in childbirth and she thought she was going to lose the child so much so that she said that she would give anything if someone could come and help her and she actually called upon the fairies to come and help her and she would give them anything so that she could have her child. And so a fairy appeared. But for most people, they can't see fairies because fairies would use their magic and would be invisible to most people. So the fairy had to actually cast a spell to make sure that this woman could see her so that she could help deliver her child. But while she was casting this spell, a man who was looking through a hole in the wall, which was a knot that had been poked through, and as he looked into the room while this stuff was going on, the spell affected his eye, his one eye, so that after that point he could see fairies. And later on in his life he was at a festival and he saw these people dancing around, two of them, and he couldn't tell why no one else could see them. He didn't understand who they were, why they were so fanciful, and why no one else could see them until he realized that they were fairies. And 
he went up to the fairies and he said that he was very happy to finally meet some fairies and be able to speak to them and say hello and the fairies were very taken aback that he could actually see them and so they asked him how he could see them and he told them the whole tale about how he could see them because one of his eyes was affected by the spell and the fairies promptly asked him which eye was it and when he told them which eye it was they promptly tore out his eye so these are the kinds of nasty things that fairies would do nasty things to make sure that no one saw them and if you did see them you would be taking your life into your hands. And to some extent, the idea of the Shea and the fairies did get mixed up with the idea of the Fomar. Because again, the Fomar could come out from underneath the sea. They were creatures as well that were thought to come from another world. And so this idea of the Shea being nasty and the Fomar being monstrous people to some extent got mixed up in the minds of people in their folklore. And so when they pictured people coming out of the hills on Sawayan's Day, that is to say on October 31st, on All Hallows' Eve, they would picture them as being nasty, monstrous things. And if you dared to venture out of your house on the day before All Saints' Day, you would be taking your life into your hands because these monstrous people would be everywhere and if you saw them, they would drag you down with them or at the very least attack you to make sure that you would never know where and how they got into this world so that you could never discover them again. And the only way that people would come up with to make sure that they didn't get attacked by these monstrous people, these vindictive people that were out on the day before All Saints, was to dress up as monsters, was to dress up as if you were a Fomar, was to dress up as if you were a Shea. And to dress up as a monster would do what the Shea had always done. It would camouflage you. It would make you look and appear as if you were one of them. So if you happen to run into a Shea, if you happen to run into a fairy, if you happen to run into a leprechaun, a Fomar, any of these monsters that would come forth out of these other worlds on the night before All Saints, then you would be camouflaged. You would look like a monster. And that's why you would dress up as a monster on the night before All Saints Day. And that is the basic reason why people dress up on Halloween. Anyways, I wanted to do this fun video. I just, I love Irish mythology. I could go on and on about it. If you actually want to hear a couple more stories about Irish mythology, you can go to my other page. Um, it's an old one that I haven't really posted anything on for a while. There's a couple of Irish myths on there, probably about 15 to 20 minutes each. You can get to that page by going to my main page and looking on the side for the reference pages uh, that I link to. I don't even remember what my old page is actually called. I do believe it's called RJ of the Island. Anyways, hopefully I've given you something new to think about, something fun to think about today. And if I did, hit like. Hit the shield in the lower right hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a message. Tell me what you think about Irish mythology and whether or not you thought this fun video was actually worth doing. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.